This question is all about the property decorator and where it comes up and what the underlying thinking is behind it. Why don't we take a look? Here's our first premise. We generally want to avoid boilerplate in our work. And so when you think about boilerplate, one of the things that you might think about immediately is when I'm writing a class, there is an enormous amount of boilerplate because this isn't enough for me to write my class. I probably need to write an init. And once I write an init, I probably need to write a wrapper and maybe I even need to write an EQ. And just to get a basic type that structures or stores two pieces of data, I'm already seven lines of code in. That's not the best bet not the best way for me to spend my time. And so I might make use of something like the collections.name tuple, or I might make use of the data classes.data class if I'm in Python 3.7 or later. And you can see both of these are boilerplate reduction tools. It's all about me reducing how much code I have to write to get started. Here's another premise. We want to avoid upfront decision making that could cause churn at the user side. And there's a couple of considerations associated with this. One of these is, Oftentimes, we're writing libraries, but why? Well, typically, we see some use case that is common enough in our user code, in the application code, in the script code. These are all synonyms for the same thing. And we say, for one line of code that I could write in a library, I could eliminate 10 lines of code in my scripts, in my applications, 10 lines of code for the users of my library. And it is very much the case that if that ratio isn't about one to 10, maybe it wasn't that valuable for us to write the library in the first place. If we write a library and it's only used by one person in one script, maybe we didn't need to write a library in the first place. The other associated problem is, well, I might have users, but I might not even be able to see those users. I may not be able to discover those users. And so if there is change in my library code, if one line of code of my library code changes and it's used in 10 different places, and some of those 10 different places I can't even see, I can't even discover, I don't even know those exist, this is going to be a big problem because that level of churn has this fan out effect. One line of code change that I make has unknown and fairly large consequences in terms of revalidating, in terms of ensuring that the change that I make doesn't break somebody else's code. And so if you think about it, if we were to start some code, and we were to write like a, we're gonna make a decision here. Like, do we write this Z as a function or as an attribute? Well, we better decide which one we want up front because you can think even something as small as changing this from a function to an attribute or from an attribute to a function is going to cause churn. And this means that at some number of points in our user's code, in our script code, in our application code, we're gonna to have to remove or add this open close parentheses. And if we have that approximate ratio of one to 10, this small change here is causing 10 lines of code of change somewhere else. And there may even be spots that we can't catch. That can be a problem. Here's another premise. Mutability introduces the risk of update anomalies. In other words, if we have some class and it contains some dependent field, for example, Z is dependent on X and Y. So the values of X and Y will uniquely determine Z. Well, if this type here is immutable, no big deal. I compute Z in my init and I'm ready to go. And there can be no subsequent changes to X or Y that could then invalidate what the value of Z is. But if this type happens to be mutable, if it's possible for me to change X, then you can see as a consequence of this change here, I now have an update anomaly. I have an update that has occurred in one place that has anomalously not cascaded that update to all of the dependent places. And so this Z value should actually have to be recomputed if I change that X value, if we're saying that Z is always equal to X plus Y. And the mutability has introduced this risk, but we can't always eliminate mutability. There are certain cases where we need mutability. Fundamentally, the world is a mutable place and the computer that our code is running on is a mutable machine. And so where we can, we might prefer immutability, but mutability is inevitably gonna cause this problem. Here's another premise. Mutability also introduces the risk of invalid data. What I mean by this is what if our type takes some initialization data and X, and it's gonna do something with that. It's gonna compute the square root of this value. Well, we can't compute the square root of a negative number unless we're willing to accept complex numbers, but this is math.square root, which is a floating point square root. It's going to fail with the math domain error if we try and take a square root of a negative number. And so 
on initialization, we might say, well, make sure that this value is non-negative, otherwise there's going to be a problem. And so if we try to create this type or an instance of this type with a negative value, we get an error, x must be non-negative. But because this type is mutable, we can cause changes after we have performed that initial validation in construction in the initializer, and these can lead to invalidity later. And it may be very hard for us to catch that, for us to address that. One important consideration. When we talk about things like constness, this is something that we talk about a lot in other programming languages, in programming languages like C++. Well, in Python, typically our notion of constness or our notion of read-only or our notion of private or public is really just a matter of convention and guidance. It's not something that we enforce at the language level. It's something that we enforce at the human level. In other words, if it were the case that one of the things that we wanted to do is prevent somebody from changing this X to enforce immutability, well, just putting an underscore before the name of this is probably enough because even though the Python interpreter won't enforce, oh, you can't assign to X, your code review process should and say, well, hold on a second, why are you assigning to X? There's a talk that I gave a couple of years back called Because You Can Run, You Can't Hide that shows that any sort of coercive attempt to enforce constness or read-onlyness or privateness really doesn't work. The only thing you can do is operate cooperatively, even in languages like C++. You can always get around some sort of const qualifier or some sort of private qualifier and touch the data if you really want to. So what you can think is, it may be the case that we may choose between writing a function or writing an attribute based on some indication we wanna give, not some control, but some indication, some guidance that we wanna to give to the user. We wanna say, oh, Z is computed, not Z is something that you can assign to. But this is not necessarily because we want to enforce it, just because we wanna make it easy for somebody to not make an error, because the enforcement is really happening in a human process in our code review process. Here is our conclusion as it relates to property. Well, generally, in order to enforce the validity of some data in some mutable type to avoid the problem where this data can be invalid or we can have update anomalies, we need to have some sort of intermediate access to the object state. In other words, if we have some type and we have these problems, one of the things that we might do is you might intermediate access to the underlying state of this object by writing getters and setters. We write a get x, a get y, and a get z, and we write a set x, and in the set x, we check our condition that x cannot be negative, that it must be non-negative. And as long as we go through this interface, we can avoid these problems. However, one of the things that you might discover here is we may not know upfront that there is this risk of update anomaly or this risk of invalidity. And as a consequence, if we're making use of a language like Java, we might have a, at least historically, a proclivity to do a lot of upfront work, to write getters and setters on day one, because we're not sure if we're gonna have to intermediate this access to this internal state on day 90. However, in Python, we have that premise. We have that strong desire to avoid boilerplate, and this is a lot of boilerplate, and to avoid upfront work when we don't necessarily know that we need it. This leads us to the idea of property. Now, of course, one other solution that we could have is we could use a name tuple, and the name tuple is immutable, but bear in mind that we're considering case closer to something like a data class where we've written this class, we want to use as little code as possible to implement this, but fundamentally it's going to be mutable. And we've identified that some computation, x plus y, needs to be reified, it needs to be turned into something that is accessible, it's available on this type, either an attribute or a function, and we need a way to make sure that this is written in such a way to avoid those two errors. Well, this is exactly where property comes in. We may decide upon discovering that there is this risk and only upon discovering this risk that instead of giving somebody raw access to this X attribute, we can now intermediate it with this property. And one of our guidances is we want to avoid code churn. One of the interesting things is between the way that we wrote the code here, where we just had an attribute X and where we lift this up to be a property, all of the user code stays the same. It looks the exact same. You still have object.x equals or object.x to retrieve this. What we've done is we've taken a class, 
We've intermediated access without causing churn in our user code, which is fantastic. Now, some user code may need to change, namely user code that is erroneous, user code where they've done something wrong, they've set X to a non-negative value. But I think that's actually what it is, it's actually what we want. It's actually exactly the behavior. We want erroneous code to be flagged, to show, hey, something has changed here, and we want correct code code which doesn't involve this error to stay as it is. This is why we use property, because after the fact, sometime in the development of our code, we want to be able to intermediate access to object state in order to avoid update anomalies or to ensure the validity for something that's mutable. And property gives us a way to do this without having to do any upfront work. Now, there's a couple of considerations when we use property. We can avoid update anomalies in a couple of different ways. We can avoid them on read or we can avoid them on write. Here you can see an update anomaly that we're going to avoid on write. That means when we change x, we perform a check and we perform a recomputation of z, which is derived from x. And so here you can see we've done the validation on write and we're doing the the computation of z on write. But we could also do this on read. We could move this check from the read side to the write side. And we could say on the, sorry, from the write side to the read side. And we could say on read, check to see that this is non, this is non negative. And then we could raise an error. And we could even compute this on read. We can compute it on read to z you actually compute this. Now, the decision for which one we want, computing on read or computing on write, is going to come down to a pretty easy question. Do we read more or do we write more? Are we changing this object more frequently than we're writing to this object? How expensive is it to do the write? How expensive is it to do the read? And in the aggregate, which of these is the least expensive approach? Except there are certain circumstances where we might want to use property on read, even if it might be more efficient on write. For example, if this property is derived from multiple different sources of data, here Z is a combination of X and Y, and it might be a little bit tricky for us to compute this on read, sorry, on write, because we're gonna have to add some sort of check on writing to X and Y to make sure that we enforce this ordering. In other words, Z can only exist when the two dependencies already exist, and in the init, there's got to be an ordering. Either x has to be set before y or y has to be set before x. And whichever that ordering is, there's going to be some intermediate state where you can't compute z because not all of the pieces exist. Here, I should actually move that there. This is a little bit buggy. There we go. And so we're going to have to do a couple of tricks to just track those dependencies. And so here, while we might say it might be more efficient to do this on write, there may be circumstances where it's a little bit too clumsy and we might do it on read even though it's less efficient. And this may be one of the reasons why we push towards immutability and we say, well, do we really need to mutate this thing? It's just so clumsy and so expensive to recompute these every single time on read. Now, how does this affect us if we are a data scientist? Well. This happens, this problem happens quite a bit in pandas. It's very often that we might have a pandas data frame which has a field that is computed from other fields. And the guidance that you often get when people talk about pandas is treat your pandas data frame as though each individual column is immutable. And the reason for that is in pandas, it is very tricky to employ this property trick in order to compute derived properties on read or on write. Here you can see one of the problems is if A or B changes, C, which according to this logic, should be the combination of A and B is invalid. There's an update anomaly here. And there's a couple of different ways we can try to approach this. We could use a registered data frame accessor with a computed namespace where the computed namespace performs this on read. Or here, in fact, this performs it on access to that descriptor, which is effectively an on read. Or we could do something like lift the data frame up into a class and compute this on read, or maybe try to intercept changes to the data frame and compute this on write. But what you can see is in the world of pandas where you might have multiple different variables that refer to the same underlying data frame, there's a lot of ways for us to sneak a change to that data frame that might not be intercepted by these mechanisms. And so really the only way for us to reliably do this given that somebody could look at that data frame, find some sort of mutable view of that data frame, and then write through that, 
you know, avoiding your setting on copy warning. Well, in that case, maybe our only option is to do this on read, which could be very expensive. And so as a consequence, maybe the best guidance is just to say, you know what, even though we see this pattern, even though this pattern exists, it's just not worth it. In the pandas world, there's too much complexity for us to address. In fact, no matter what we do, this kind of property approach, works pretty well in the pure Python domain, but with some of our computational types, we definitely do find that there are limitations. One of the other things that we might think about is this general idea of the property doesn't really exist anywhere in the standard library. There are cases where there's a distinction between a function call and an attribute in the standard library in order to indicate that something is computed versus something is just a static piece of data. And the only place I could think of where you see either in the core interpreter or in the standard library where they won't make this distinction is a very interesting little piece current frame.locals, a frame objects.f locals is actually akin to a property. It doesn't use a property mechanism, but it is something where they've intermediated attribute access in order to perform a computed operation. Here's what I mean. Here you can see the local variables of this function have not updated once I've added something to the local state. I have to do a current frame.f locals before I see this get updated. But the interesting thing is, it's not the reassignment to flocals that actually does this. It's really just the attribute access to flocals. If I don't even bother doing anything with this, if I just perform this attribute access, you can see this is kind of like intermediated access. It's kind of like that property pattern where behind the scenes it's updating in place this dictionary. And you can see this can easily lead to all sorts of weird update anomalies. If this were some kind of behavior that was in the standard library itself, but in the case of current frame f locals, well, this is a consequence of some of the optimizations that are done to support things like fast locals. And this is something which people aren't usually digging around in that area of the interpreter, so it gets a pass.